We're in Manchester, the city at the heart of the Industrial Revolution. Manchester's location, as is true for many pre-modern commercial cities, is tied above all to water. Manchester has three rivers, the Irwell, the Irk, and the Medlock. And those rivers are crucially important in an era in which moving goods over land is enormously expensive. Of course, in Manchester's past, these rivers are at least as important for power as they are for mobility. In a world before steam engines, mills, whether for grain or for anything else, rely upon water power. And so the rivers of Manchester are its source of power. But before 1700, it was a relatively modest affair. Like many English towns, it was a city built on weaving. Of course, England had a great cloth tradition built primarily around wool because, of course, this colder clime is better endowed with woolly sheep than it is with cotton plants. In the 17th century, cotton itself is becoming far more popular in England. It's imported by the British East India Company, which finds a ready market for the washable, light, colorful fabrics that come from the East. This market grows, and it grows so much that in 1721, Parliament passes the Calico Act which bars the import of Indian cotton fabric into the United Kingdom. And so, there's a demand for cotton. You can't import cotton fabric. Manchester starts weaving. And Manchester becomes one of the cities that specializes in producing woven cotton fabric. Now, over the course of the 18th century, investments are made that actually strengthen Manchester's watery assets. In 1724, the Mersey and Irwell navigation improves the mobility along these ancient waterways. It becomes possible to travel by water all the way down to Liverpool from Manchester and from there to the sea. In 1761, the Duke of Bridgewater, who has a coal mine, invests in the Bridgewater Canal, which will enable his coal to be brought cheaply to Manchester, enabling the price of coal to plummet making sure that Manchester has ready access to a cheap source of power. Twelve years later, in 1773, the Bridgewater Canal would then be connected further on to make it a possible egress all the way to the sea. This canal, the Rochdale Canal, is completed in 1804, and it improves the connections between Manchester and Yorkshire, making Manchester even more a center of waterborne inland commerce. In 1894, all of these earlier water linkages to the sea were superseded by the Manchester Ship Canal, which helped turn Manchester, a city 40 miles from the sea, into the third largest port in England. Of course, by the mid-19th century, railroads would end up being more important than canals. Those railroads could go anywhere and ended the advantage that any particular place had from its rivers. But the crucial point is that Manchester got lucky. It had these watery advantages at the exact moment when the new ideas of the Industrial Revolution were in the air. It had the advantage of access to the sea of access to Yorkshire, of access to the coal mines, at exactly the point where new industrialists like Arkwright were thinking of ways to urbanize their mills. And so Manchester became a city of mills, a city abetted by its water, but a city in which human creativity could then use those assets to make a marvel.